Hi, I'm David Swanson, Executive Director of World Beyond War, and I am joined by Alice Slater and Bruce Gagnon for this virtual panel called Obstacles to Nuclear Abolition, the U.S.-Russian Relationship. So I'll give you my thoughts for 10 minutes and then introduce Alice and then Bruce. Obstacles to nuclear abolition in my mind include the corruption of legalized bribery and the capacity of the human mind to believe nonsense. The latter is more educational to talk about. Here are some things your typical US resident is likely to believe. Vladimir Putin made Donald Trump president and bosses him around. Nuclear weapons keep me safe. The global policeman keeps me safe. This past week, a poll show, showed that the US public strongly supported moving 10% of US military spending to human needs, but the US Congress voted down that proposal by a wide margin. So simply having democracy rather than constantly arming and bombing in its name would move the US in the right direction. But there were no crowds in the streets or on the front lawns of Congress members. Hardly a word was forced into the corporate media. If we want the U.S. Congress to take 10% out of the military, we're going to need the U.S. public to passionately demand taking 75 or maybe 100% out. That is, we will need people dedicated to the vision of war abolition. And that means ceasing to believe nonsense. If Putin owns Trump and nuclear weapons keep you safe, then Putin keeps you safe and Putin is the global policeman. But nobody who believes Putin owns Trump and that nuclear weapons keep us safe believes Putin keeps them safe. Nobody believes what they believe. This is a common pattern. If Congressman John Lewis is now in a much better, happier place hanging with his old crew, as the US media tells me, then Trump is doing many thousands of people a great favor by spreading coronavirus. Nobody believes that. If the military is a service, then the majority of these disastrous murderous wars, or at least one of them, must benefit us somehow. Many realize they do not, yet still claim the military is a service. A radio host this week asked me if I could at least honor all members of the military who didn't take part in any wars. It's like honoring all the healthcare workers who have never provided any healthcare. But also, if Putin owns Trump, wants Trump to sabotage rocket Russian economic interests, expel and sanction Russian diplomats, shred treaties with Russia, destroy the Iran agreement, refuse to cooperate on disarmament or cyber war or weapons in space or Syria. Putin wants a much larger US military with, with more bases around the world, a bigger NATO with, with more bases and weapons and war games on Russia's border. Putin secretly must be demanding these things while publicly protesting them because his evil genius surpasses our understanding. Now, I think Putin has far more power than any human being should have, but I don't think he has superpowers. I also don't think he's paying for U.S. scalps in Afghanistan or that doing so would change the fact that during the past 19 years of illegal war and occupation, the U.S. military has been one of the top two funders of its own enemies, the other top source of income being the opium trade revived by the invasion. The latest lies about Russia helped Congress vote for more military money and vote down ending any wars and block removing any troops from anywhere. These lies helped more weapons dealers dump more money into Joe Biden, whose foreign policy is literally fantasy. That is to say, he refrains from explicitly describing it, allowing people to fantasize it instead. I had a coalition this week ask me to sign on to a statement urging uh, Joe Biden to have a good policy on Palestine. The statement made reference to Biden's positive steps in other areas of foreign policy. But when I asked, the statement organizers effectively admitted that they just made that up. There weren't actually any positive steps in other areas of foreign policy. The latest lies about Russia have a long, long pedigree. While the US and Russia were war allies during World War I, the U.S. in 1917 sent funding to one side, the anti-revolutionary side of a Russian civil war, 
worked to blockade the Soviet Union and in 1918 sent U.S. troops to Murmansk, Archangel, and Vladivostok in an attempt to overthrow the new Russian government. The threat of the communists, as an example, albeit a deeply flawed one of taking wealth away from oligarchs, was a driving force in U.S. foreign affairs from 1920 up to all during and long after World War II. In fact, up to and including putting oligarchs in power in Russia, in, and including being a driving force behind Western support for the rise of the Nazis. The Russians had turned the tide against the Nazis outside Moscow and begun pushing the Germans back before the United States ever entered World War II. The Soviets implored the US to attack Germany from the West from that moment until the summer of 1944, that is to say, for two and a half years wanting the Russians to do most of the killing and dying as they did. The US and Britain also did not want the Soviet Union making a new deal with or taking sole control of Germany. The allies agreed that any defeated nation would have to surrender to all of them and completely. The Russians went along with this, yet in Italy, Greece, France, etc., the US and Britain cut Russia out, almost completely banned communists, shut out leftist resistors to the Nazis, and reimposed right-wing governments that the Italians called fascism without Mussolini. The US would leave behind spies and terrorists and saboteurs in various European countries to fend off any communist influence. Originally scheduled for the first day of Roosevelt and Churchill's meeting with Stalin in Yalta, the US and the British bombed the city of Dresden flat, destroying its buildings and its artwork and its civilian population, apparently as a means of threatening Russia. The US then developed and used on Japanese cities nuclear bombs, a decision driven largely by the desire to see Japan surrender to the US alone, without the Soviets and by the desire to threaten the Soviet Union. Immediately upon German surrender, Winston Churchill proposed using Nazi troops together with allied troops to attack the Soviet Union, the nation that had just done the bulk of the work of defeating the Nazis. This was not an off the cuff proposal. The US and British had sought and achieved partial German surrenders, had kept German troops armed and ready and had debriefed German commanders on their failure against the Russians. Attacking the Russians sooner rather than later was a view advocated by General George Patton and by Hitler's replacement, Admiral Karl Donitz, not to mention Alan Dulles and the OSS. Dulles made a separate peace with Germany and Italy to cut out the Russians and began sabotaging democracy in Europe immediately and empowering former Nazis in Germany as well as importing them to the U.S and into the US military to focus on the coming war against Russia. Lies about Soviet threats and missile gaps and Russian tanks in Korea and global communist conspiracies became the biggest profit makers for US weapons companies, not to mention Hollywood movie studios in history, as well as the biggest threat to peace in various corners of the globe, and they still are. Muslim terrorists just don't sell weapons on the scale of the Russian menace, but they were armed by the United States in Afghanistan and elsewhere to fight Russia. When Germany reunited, the US and allies lied to the Russians that NATO would not expand. Then NATO quickly began expanding eastward. Meanwhile, the US openly bragged about imposing Boris Yeltsin and corrupt crony capitalism on Russia by interfering in a Russian election in collusion with Yeltsin. NATO developed into an aggressive global war maker and expanded right up to Russia's borders where the US began installing missiles. Russian requests to join NATO or Europe were dismissed out of hand. Russia was to remain a designated enemy even without the communism and even without constituting any threat or engaging in any hostility. Russia is an ordinary country with a military that costs five to 10% what the US military costs. Russia has, like other countries, a horrible government. But Russia is not a threat to the United States, and the vast bulk of what people in the United States are told about Russia is ridiculous lies. Mikhail Gorbachev, whom we had hoped to have on this panel, continues not only to urge the elimination of nuclear weapons, but to point out that until the US ceases its aggression toward the world with non-nuclear weapons, 
other nations won't give up their nukes. Nuclear abolition is a step toward war abolition. But the opposite is also true. War abolition is a step toward nuclear abolition. And with that, I have the great pleasure of introducing Alice Slater, who serves on uh, probably more boards than I can list, but they include the Board of World Beyond War and the Board of the Global Network Against Weapons and Nuclear Power in Space. And she represents the Nuclear Age Peace Foundation at the United Nations and is a member of the New York City People's Climate Committee. Alice Slater, take it away. David, I mean, I just have to say that you have laid out some of the truth of what exists between the US and Russia. And I'm looking at it in terms of our, our nuclear history, because right now we have 13,000 nuclear bombs on the planet and almost 12,000 are in the US and Russia. All the other countries have a thousand between them. That's England, France, China, Israel, India, Pakistan, North Korea. So if we and Russia can't get together and figure this out, you know, we're, we're in big trouble. The well, atomic scientists has moved the doomsday clock up a minute, you know, to less than a minute to midnight. So um, the, the history, it's still of the bomb, which you explained. We use the atomic bomb in Hiroshima and Nagasaki even though we were being told by Eisenhower and Omar Bradley that Japan was getting ready to surrender, they wanted to use the bomb before the Soviets got into our alliance because we had ended the war in Europe in May and this was August of 1945 and they dropped the bomb so they could end it quickly and not have to divide uh, the Japanese occupation with the Soviets like we were doing with Eastern Europe. So after we used the bomb, Stalin proposed to Truman that we turn it over to the United Nations. After all, the Allies got together, we formed this international group. The number one demand of the United Nations was to end the scourge of war. And Stalin said to Truman, turn the bomb over to the UN, and we did not, and he got the bomb. And that's how the history has gone all through the, uh, I have a, a list here I wanted to just go over. After that happened, Reagan rejected when the war fell down and Gorbachev let go of all of Eastern Europe without a shot. Gorbachev said to Reagan, let's get rid of nuclear weapons. Reagan said, great idea. Gorbachev said, don't do Star Wars. Chris Bruce will be telling you about this, but we have a document to dominate and control the military use of space. Reagan said, I'm not giving up Star Wars, so Gorbachev pulled it off the table. Then he was very nervous about a unified Germany being part of NATO because they lost 27 million Russians to the Nazi onslaught. I had no idea of that, and we do not hear this number. And Gorbachev and Reagan said to Gorbachev, don't worry, let Germany reunite, we'll take them into NATO. We promise you we will not expand NATO one inch to the east. Well, we're right up to their border. We're doing war games on their border. I mean, it's awful. The other thing that's not really nuclear, but it was like another uh, dis, dis to the Russian promises that we made was when Clinton bombed Kosovo, because when we formed the United Nations, and we gave everybody this veto in the Security Council to guard against what happened with the League of Nations, where it just became a talking uh, group and never did anything. Clinton bombed Kosovo over the Russian veto. That's the first time we ever did that. We have a treaty with the United Nations that we will never commit a war of aggression unless we're an imminent threat of uh, you know, attack. Then, then we can fight back. Well, Kosovo was not imminently attacking us, and they cooked up this whole new doctrine, this Susan Rice that they got on the list of vice president now, of responsibility to protect, like we can bomb the crap out of you to save your life, and that's what we did there, and that was a total uh, blow to the UN and whatever we had agreed to with them, you know. Then uh, Bush 
walked out of the end. Oh, Putin offered Clinton. We were already looking at missile emplacements in Romania. He said, look, let's cut to a thousand nuclear weapons each. We had already gotten down from 70,000 to about 16 at that time. And we knew how to verify, we knew how to inspect. We had, de we had developed a whole system with Russia of watching us dismantle our weapons and their weapons and making sure it was happening. He said, look, let's cut to 1,000 each and call everybody at the table to negotiate for abolition, but don't put missiles in Romania, Clinton refused. Bush walked out of the 1972 anti-ballistic missile treaty that we had with the Soviets since 72. Yeah, 72. He walked out of it and put the missiles in Romania and Trump is putting them in Poland right now. And then uh, Bush and Obama blocked any discussion in 2008, 2014 on Russian and Chinese proposals for space weapons ban. And you had needed consensus. The Committee on Disarmament in Geneva, well, they blocked it. Then Obama, we, we boasted about the Stuxnet virus that we attacked uh, with Israel. We attacked Iran's enrichment facility. Putin proposed to Obama, let's have a cyber war ban, and we turned him down. It's like we have turned down every decent propo proposal. We never ratified the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty, which Russia did, and then um, Obama made this little deal with Medvedev, who was Putin's substitute president for a few years, where they cut 1,500 warheads out of the 16,000, whatever it was, and he promised the Congress a trillion dollars over 20 years for two new bomb factories in Oak Ridge and uh, Los Alamos, new weapons, missiles, submarines, airplanes, so it never stopped. And Putin was making speeches in 2016. He said how upset Russia was. We, 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 de we depended on the ABM treaty. We were categorically against their pulling out. We saw it as a cornerstone in the international security system. And uh, we did our best to dissuade the Americans from dissuading all in vain. They pulled out of the treaty. And they, even then they tried to work and then they decided, well, we have to improve our modern strike systems to protect our security. That's where Russia was coming from. And then our military, industrial, academic, congressional complex used this as an excuse to up the ante and build more weapons in this country. And it's very interesting that this uh, June, Putin gave a speech on the anniversary of World War II, the 75th anniversary of the end of World War II, which was in May, I think. He gave the speech in June. And we, our Eastern allies, these NATO allies that were helping the Nazis march into Russia, you know, like Poland, they had a celebration and they kept Russia out of it, even though Russia won the war and like Putin made his speech about how we have to um, have a more neglecting net the, the lessons of history inevitably lead to a harsh payback. We will firmly uphold the truth based on documental historical facts. We'll continue to be honest and impartial about the events of World War II. This includes a large scale project to establish Russia's largest collections of archival records, films, and photo materials about the history. He's calling for an international commission to study it and tell the truth. And I think we have to back an international commission, Truth and Reconciliation, ask maybe the Secretary General, he, this is a great Secretary General, he called for global ceasefire during the virus and they actually passed it in the Security Council. I don't know what that means because we're still not ceasing fire, but it was an idea that's out there, and I really do want to find out more about that. But maybe ask the Secretary General to call for a truth telling with historians and, you know, public citizens from Russia, from America, from Europe, from all over. What really happened, you know, between the US and Russia? What do we have to know? How can we keep demonizing them? I mean, our media is so bored by the military. The, the news is so, I hate to, echo Trump. It's fake news. We're getting it, you know. So that's my thought. <laughs>
Uh, much to think about. Thank you, uh, Alice, um, and thank you for all the wonderful work you're doing. Um, let's uh, let's bring up Bruce. Gagnon, a uh, longtime great peace activist, the coordinator of the Global Network Against Weapons and Nuclear Power in Space. Bruce Gagnon was uh, a co-founder of that network when it was created in 1992. You can read all about it and him at spaceforpeace.org. It's a numeral for spaceforpeace.org. I can't go through Bruce's long bio, but you can find it for yourself. Uh, Bruce is also the host of a public access TV show called This Issue that runs on 17, runs in 17 main communities. Uh, Bruce is a Vietnam era veteran and began his organizing career by working for the United Farm Workers Union in Florida, organizing fruit pickers. He is an active member of Veterans for Peace, uh, and for a long time has been based in Maine. Uh, Bruce Gagnon, welcome. Thank you. Thank you, David. Alice, thank you as well. It's great to be with both of you. Uh, this is a really important discussion, I think. Uh, so few of our fellow uh, organizers and friends and activists in the peace movement speak uh, honestly about the U.S. demonization of Russia. Uh, it's kind of an unallowed subject. And uh, so I'm glad to see us breaking this very thick ice and dangerous ice. It really must be done. You both mentioned something that I want to just add a bit to. You both talked about how in World War II, uh, the former Soviet Union lost about 27 million of their citizens fighting against the Nazis. Uh, but what you didn't mention was that the United States lost 500,000 troops. Compare 500,000 to 27 million, I think it's a stark difference. And what Alice just said a minute ago about this recent commemoration of World War II, where Russia was not even invited to participate by the quote unquote NATO allies of today. Uh, this has repeatedly happened in the last couple of years. The French celebrations at Normandy, uh, where the United States and the Brits all go. The Russians are not invited. What they're doing is essentially erasing history, rewriting history for the younger generation, making sure that they don't know uh, the contributions of Russia against the Nazis. And that, to me, this is really evil. Uh, this kind of thing. And it, it is clear why Russia begins to get so paranoid these days as they see the United States and NATO encircling them with troops and with bases on virtually all of their borders, <clears throat> both east and in west and north and south. Uh, the U.S. <clears throat> has been blocking progress, <clears throat> excuse me, on disarmament negotiations with Russia for a long time. As you've both said, I can remember at least for the last 15 years, both Russia and China saying over and over again in official uh, 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 representations that as long as you continue to surround us both, Russia and China, with missile defense systems, which are key elements in US first strike attack planning. They're the shield, missile defense systems are the shield that would be used after a US first strike attack to pick off any retaliatory strikes by Russia and China. So they're saying, both Beijing and, and Moscow are saying, as long as the US continues to encircle us, we cannot afford to reduce our nuclear missiles. It's our only uh, retaliatory capability. It's our only way of defending ourselves against first strike attack. First strike attack that both Russia and China have renounced, but the US refuses to renounce. First strike attack that the US Space Command has been annually wargaming for years. They sit at a computer, they have a, a a military lawyer sitting next to them. They say, can we use uh, the space-based laser 
as part of our first strike attack to take out any retaliatory strikes by Russia and China? Can we use the military space plane, the X-37, to drop down from orbit uh, and drop an attack on Russia and China as part of the first strike attack war game? Can we use that? And in both cases, the military lawyer says, yes, no problem, because the Outer Space Treaty of 1967 only outlaws weapons of mass destruction in space, and both the uh, military space plane, the successor to the shuttle, and the Death Star, the orbiting battle station that they've long been talking about, are weapons of selective destruction and therefore fall outside of the Outer Space Treaty. So this is the kind of stuff that Russia and China both are witness to. And then on top of that, as Alice said, for many years now, 25 years or more, uh, the uh, Canadians, the United States, excuse me, the Canadians, Russia, and China have gone to the uh, UN uh, General Assembly introducing the Paros Resolution, Prevention of an Arms Race and Out of, out of Space Resolution that is voted on overwhelmingly with only the U.S. and Israel objecting. And then it's sent to the Conference on Disarmament for further negotiations, a treaty to ban all weapons in space, and there, again, the U.S. and Israel have effectively blocked it for all these years. The official position of the U.S. during both Republican and Democrat administrations, that means Clinton, that means Obama, and uh, all the Republicans as well, the official position is, hey, there's no problem. There are no weapons in space. We don't need a treaty. Well, obviously, it is the military industrial complex, the aerospace corporations that intend to get wealthy beyond imagination from an arms race in space that are making sure this all gets blocked. The U.S. has been talking about for a long time controlling and dominating space and denying other countries access to space in times of hostility. And in fact, at the Space Command headquarters at Peterson Air Force Base in Colorado, just above their doorway, they have their logo that reads Master of Space. They wear it as a patch on their uniform. And now we've seen the creation of the Space Force as well that they say will cost 15 billion in the next couple years, but I can promise you there's gonna be a lot more money being pumped into it than that. And where will this money come from? Some years ago in one of the industry publications called Space News, they ran an editorial saying, we've gotta be responsible corporate citizens. We've gotta come up with a dedicated funding source to pay for all of this, what I call pyramids to the heavens. The aerospace industry are the new pharaohs of our age, building these pyramids, and we, the taxpayers, will be the slaves turning over everything we have. And so in this editorial, the aerospace industry said, we've identified a dedicated funding source. It's the entitlement programs that officially are Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, and what's left of the tattered social safety net. So this is how they intend to pay for a new arms race in space by creating total poverty, you could really say, I think, in this country, a return to feudalism, neo-feudalism. So I want to say a word about more about these missile defense systems, the shield that is now being used to encircle Russia and China. They're based on missile defense uh, interceptors are based on Navy Aegis destroyers that are made two blocks from where I'm sitting right now at Bath Iron Works here in Maine, which is currently on strike, by the way. The workers are on strike because the General Dynamics Corporation that owns Bath Iron Works is fleecing the workers, trying to subcontract out, trying to get rid of the union. And actually, I've gone down uh, this week. I was down there and joined the picket line and uh, several of us from Veterans for Peace here in Maine will be joining the picket line every week because we support the workers' right to uh, have a union. And while we're there, we talk to them about our idea of converting the shipyard to build 
uh, commuter rail systems, offshore wind turbines, tidal power systems to help us deal with our real problem today, which is climate change. That if we don't get serious about this climate crisis, we're uh, not facing not much of a future. So anyway, these ships uh, loaded with these so-called missile defense systems are being sent to encircle Russia and China. They're in the Mediterranean, the Barents, the Bering, the Black Seas encircling Russia today. And on board are the SM-3 interceptor missiles that would be used to pick off any uh, Russian retaliatory strikes after a U.S. first strike attack. And also on board are from the, fired from the same uh, silos on these ships are Tomahawk cruise missiles, which are first strike attack weapons, uh, fly below radar detection, and are nuclear capable. And so now what's happened during the Obama administration, because uh, there are various missile defense systems, some test better than others. These Aegis destroyer testing program has been the most effective, not perfect, but the most effective. And so they've created a program called Aegis Ashore. And so they're now putting these Aegis launch facilities, taking them from the ships, also putting them on land. They put them in Romania. And as Alice said, they're going into Poland as well. They're in Hawaii now. Uh, and they're looking at, they wanted to put them into Japan, but Japan has just uh, uh, said no to two Aegis Ashore sites in their country, largely because of uh, peace okay. movement protests in Japan. But in the case of the one in Romania and the one that's going into Poland, they will be able to, again, launch these SM-3 interceptor missiles, the shield, to be used after a U.S. first strike attack. But again, in the same silos, they can also fire these Tomahawk cruise missiles, which in the case of Romania and Poland would be able to reach Moscow in 10 minutes' time. Now think of that the Cuban Missile Crisis in reverse, right? What would the United States do if Russia or China were putting uh, missile, first strike attack, nuclear capable missiles 10 minutes time from Washington off our shores in Mexico or Canada? We would go ballistic. We'd be going insane. But when we do it to Russia or China, it doesn't make the newspapers. Nobody in this country knows anything about it. And when the Russians and Chinese complain about it, they're just accused of being, oh, just they're communists, they're crazy. Who wants to listen to them? In addition to all of this, the United States has been setting up military hubs, military equipment hubs in Norway and Poland. They hold war games in these places. And on uh, big, um, massive naval supply ships, they send over tanks, armored personnel carriers, artillery systems from the United States, along with the troops that go to participate in these war games in Norway, right on the Russian border, in Poland, very near the Russian border. And then when the troops come back to the United States after the war games, they leave the equipment there. They're stockpiling it for an eventual war with Russia in both Poland and Norway. And so this is escalating uh, tensions beyond imagination. And again, the American people know nothing about it. And few in the peace movement ever saying a word about it either. We're constantly still, even within the peace movement, demonizing Russia and China when the United States and NATO are clearly the aggressors in this situation. So if we want to end war, if we want to stop this massive metastasizing, steroidal, cancerous military budget of ours so that we can deal with the, the economic and social and climate crisis in this country, we're going to have to look at where our troops are going and what they're doing. Thank you both very much for inviting me.
Uh, thank you, Bruce, and thank you, Alice. Wonderful job. Could, could we maybe ask each other a couple of questions? I certainly have a couple of questions for each of you, and, uh, and if you have any for, for me or each other. Um, maybe starting with, uh, starting with Alice. Um, Alice, how many people there in New York City where you are know that Russia gave the United States a giant monument uh, to the victims of the 9-11 attacks uh, that uh, the United States hid away over uh, in New Jersey? Nobody. I mean, I just discovered it recently. I mean, I just read about, I don't know where I read about it, probably in some alternative press, but you know, I mean, it's just so unbelievable how we treat Russia. I had my own experience of this. I went to Queens College in 1955 during the McCarthy era, and we were terrified of communists. I mean, they executed the Rosenbergs, you know, you couldn't believe it. So I was having a discussion with somebody in the cafeteria, she said, here, you should read this. And she gives me this pamphlet. It says, Communist Party of America. My heart is pounding in terror. I go home on the bus, I go up to the A4, I walk directly to the incinerator and throw it down to shoot without opening it. That's how scared we were of communists. And when I finally got there, after Gorbachev was elected, and uh, I was at the Lawyers Alliance, they had stopped nuclear testing when we were going over there to ask them if they'd let our seismologists go to their test site, because Congress didn't want to respond, you can't trust the Russians. So we got a team of seismologists raise money, and Russia said, yes, we'll let you put them in Senate. And I see every guy over 60 is walking around with his World War II medals on his chest, and every street corner has a monument to the dead, and the Leningrad Cemetery, 400,000 mass graves and my guide says to me, why don't you Americans trust us? I said, why don't we trust you? What about Hungary? What about Czechoslovakia? He looks at me like with tears in his eyes. But we had to protect ourselves from Germany. And I looked at the guy and I said, that was their truth. I mean, we were getting such baloney that they were never coming after us. They were digging in. I mean, it wasn't nice what they did to Eastern Europe, but they weren't going to let the Nazis walk through like Poland gave them a free ride to walk through and, you know, and Napoleon invaded into Moscow. So I just felt so betrayed by my own government, what they were doing stories they were cooking up to scare us. It wasn't, they were never coming after us. I have, a, I have a, another question for you, Alice, or for Bruce, whoever wants to speak to this, but uh, I, I read Dan Ellsberg's new book, maybe not new anymore, last year or so, uh, about uh, nuclear planning back uh, when he was in the government. Uh, and the plan that they had, whether first strike or retaliatory, uh, was every major city in both Soviet Union and China. Uh, and the plan was expected as they had drafted it in the US government to kill one third of humanity. Uh, that is without counting the impacts of fire and without counting the impacts of a nuclear winter, which presumably would be global. The, the, the intention and the expectation was to murder one third of humanity. Is, has anyone managed to FOIA or otherwise discover exactly what percentage of humanity they, they currently are planning to murder if these weapons are ever used? I don't know. That's a good question. We should talk to Dan Ellsberg. He would know who to do, how to get this done. <laughs> I'll, I'll ask him. Fighting it. I would like to tell this story related to, to your question. Okay. A dear friend of ours just recently passed away here in Maine. His name was Bob Dale. He was a former Navy pilot during uh, just after World War II as a young man. Uh, he was a bomber pilot, and his mission every day was to fly over China, and he had one designated city. You can imagine, and there were many planes on these missions, and they each had a designated city that he was to fly over and drop a nuclear bomb on 
if so instructed. He said at the time he didn't think anything of it. But uh, he later, of course, became a peace activist and a member of Veterans for Peace and died in his late 90s just uh, very recently. But this was immediately after the war when, when uh, China was decimated by World War II. There was no threat to anyone whatsoever. And the United States at that time was planning to annihilate much of uh, m most of the uh, major cities in China. So th this is a true story that uh, you're suggesting uh, uh, or uh, sharing from uh, yeah. Dan Ellsberg. Okay, I, Bruce, I thought you were going to tell this story. Bruce organized a meeting for the Global Network in Huntsville, Alabama. Oh, I was there. Were you, were you there, Alice? Yeah, well, we had the same one. He might have done it more than once. Like but me. we went to the museum, the Edward Teller Museum, with the with the demonstrate with the exhibit of Operation Paperclip, where we brought Nazi scientists to Alabama before the end of the war to do our rockets because the Germans had a great rocket program going. Like and they had a museum in Alabama honoring them. I I was like stunned. Yeah, I, I sadly I missed the trip to the museum, but uh, it's, it's part of Huntsville history, right, Bruce? Yeah, in fact, uh, the, there's a hill there that they say that the Germans moved to when they moved to that city uh, when Operation Paperclip brought uh, uh, Werner von Braun and his rocket team to the United States. Yeah, and uh, the Germans said the hill reminded them of Germany, and so they lived up on this hill. And they, uh, the people locally say you can't criticize them because they brought us theater and they brought us ballet and they brought us the orchestra. They brought us culture to this cotton farming uh, community of uh, northern Alabama. So uh, they're very much admired and revered there. Uh, but people forget that... Uh, what they had participated in, you know, this same rocket team building the V1 and V2 rockets for Hitler that he used to terrorize the city of cities of London and Paris and Brussels at the end of World War II. Uh, Major General Walter Dornberger, who was Hitler's liaison to von Braun and the rocket team, he came to the United States under Operation Paperclip, became an executive at Bell Aerospace, and in the 50s testified to the Congress before the Congress of the United States saying that, gentlemen, I didn't come to this country to lose the third world war. I lost two already. And he talked about orbiting battle stations in space that would allow the US to control the earth below and the pathway on and off the planet. So his words essentially were the crowning vision of the US military space program. And now today, he, he would be very happy to see that his Nazi prophecy, prophecy is coming to fruition with the creation of the Space Force. You know what I was thinking as you were speaking, Bruce, you know how we are taking down the statues and the Confederates and renaming the military? We ought to do something about that base in Huntsville, Alabama, the museum. We ought to do something about that. Like, you know, we should add that into the spots that we want to dismantle. Well, I, I, want to, I want to close them all, not just rename them, but... Oh, but, I know, but I'm saying that... Rename them, but, but I was going to mention that those, those rocket scientists had not just built rockets that, that bombed London, which was the wrong place to bomb, but they'd used slave labor to build them, and they didn't have to bring racist, pro-slavery, apartheid attitudes to Huntsville, Alabama in 1945. <laughs> they were there. They were there. Uh, they fit right in. That's the point. And they fit right in to the U.S. military. Culture. They didn't Nazify the U.S. military. They took traditions that the Nazis had, in some cases, borrowed from the U.S. military and continued them. Um, uh, I, uh, well, I, I have a couple more questions if you have time, and if, if neither of you do. Um, uh, Bruce, you mentioned, you know, 500,000 dead in the U.S. in World War II. What happens when we surpass that with coronavirus? Uh, does 
celebrating coronavirus become a major tradition in U.S. culture the way World War II is? Uh, and, and if not, can we, can we make anybody think about why? It, it, think about the difference. Are they going to give the survivors medals? And they, they, certainly, they, they certainly don't want to give the survivors of the virus uh, much assistance and much medical care unless they happen to have a, 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 a comma and an INC after their name. But, uh, uh, you know, it's, uh, I keep thinking about 9-11, uh, and I keep thinking about those couple thousand people that tragically died on 9-11. Uh, I don't quite share the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the media's, uh, the mainstream media story as to what really happened that day. But anyway, uh, it was a tragedy for those couple thousand people. But when you remember how the, the country mourned and was pulling its hair out of its head and wanted to go to war over, over that incident in comparison to how our government is really just sort of ipso facto, uh, you know, it's not a big deal. Uh, well, they're, you know, it's going to get worse. And, you know, we're, we're now uh, losing uh, many times more than 9-11. It's just remarkable how this country is uh, is just so uh, really calm about this fact. Uh, that tells us a lot, I think. When they say they value human life more than other countries, I don't think it's true whatsoever. I think Mostly, they're they're happy to see people of color largely in the highest percentage dying, and they they don't really care about that. They don't really seem to be taking any steps to ameliorate that that uh, really tragic circumstance. No, statistics came out that there were so many black and and brown people and poor people dying because they were living in crowded conditions and they couldn't self isolate and everything. That's when I think they opened everything up because they didn't care. They figured, you know, we're not going to die. They're going to die. And that's why they did that thing. And now it's hitting them in the face and all of us in the face. I mean, it's, is yeah. it more evil or is it more stupid? It's always hard to, to tell which because it's such a combination uh, <laughs> one-two punch. Um, uh, I... I you know, Bruce mentioned that, that, that it's understandable how paranoid Russia is, but then also mentioned that we're dealing with a Cuban Missile Crisis in reverse, and Russia is showing unbelievable restraint. Um, I, I'm not sure they're paranoid at all. I think they're almost, uh, that, that Russia is, is just, for all the deep flaws in the Russian government and Russian culture, like all governments and cultures, just incredible restraint and patience uh, and forbearance that I just can't imagine in some other parts of the world. Am I, am I wrong? Well, I think it's true. I think it's very true. More patient than, uh, than they ought to be, really. But they also are very uh, clear. They say that they will not allow the United States to control and dominate space. Both Russia and China are saying this. They will not allow the United States to encircle them militarily without a response. But uh, Russia is also clear over and over again that everything they are doing is defensive, that they are developing hypersonic weapons, uh, but not to be used in a first strike attack, to only be used in a retaliatory uh, scenario. And so, and I believe them uh, because that is their history. That is the way they've acted for many years. You know, Sweden, did you know that Sweden invaded Russia like 37 times or something to that effect? Uh, Russia was invaded, as Alice said, by Napoleon, uh, by Hitler, by the United States, as you said, Dave, during uh, soon after the Russian Revolution. They've been uh, invaded repeatedly. And so they're very clear that they've had enough of that. They've had enough of it, and they're not going to stand for it again. And uh, they'll try to negotiate. They're willing to talk always. They're always uh, one of the leaders. You know, when you look at the Iran nuclear deal, Putin, you know, 
Putin uh, didn't get much credit, but he really pulled that thing together. When you look at uh, most negotiations, the India-China uh, negotiations, Putin was credited with very recently being heavily involved in that and helping to uh, reduce the conflict between those two countries that could have easily uh, escalated into a nuclear situation. So, uh, you know, I think they've shown, Russia has shown a real statesmanlike uh, proclivity, but uh, the United States just so arrogant, so brazen, withdrawing from every treaty imaginable, sticking it in their face, Pompeo laughing and saying, oh, we lie, we cheat, we steal with the CIA, you know. Uh, but, uh, I mean, it's an embarrassment how our country uh, continues uh, to act around the world. Uh, but uh, I, I, I just, it's sad that Russia doesn't get a better shake than they get. Uh, and uh, I'm, I've been there now a couple times. You each have been there as well. And it's not anything like uh, it's made out to be, just as when I went to Cuba. When I lived in Florida, I used to organize trips from the Florida Coalition for Peace and Justice to Cuba. And, uh, you know, it's... Uh, it was called pick the forbidden fruit, you know, come down and see for yourself. And, you know, we, we, we begin to realize that things are never as bad as America makes them out to be. Uh, our country really, really uh, is really good at making people afraid of other nations and demonizing them so badly. So uh, I've come to now say, you know, after about three trips to Russia that, uh, I, I don't care what anyone says about me. I don't care what anyone thinks about me. I'm going to uh, say what I what I believe to be the truth about Russia, that they are not bad. They are not evil. They are not a scourge on this earth. They're just like everybody else. They love their children. They love their, uh, their culture, their history. Uh, they love to eat. They love to laugh. They love to drink. They're just wonderful people and uh, just like everybody else. They have the greatest writers, Dostoevsky, Chekhov, Tolstoy, and the music. I mean, anybody that can write music like that has soul. So. But, you know, uh, there's something about Cuba I wanted to say. We took our missiles out of Turkey secretly because Kennedy couldn't tell Congress he was making a deal with Russia when but they put our, their missiles into Cuba after we put our missiles in Turkey on their border. In other words, nobody even knew this part of the story. So then they took the missiles out of Cuba quietly. A year later, we took our missiles out of Turkey. And guess what? They're back with nuclear weapons. We have five NATO countries that have nuclear, our nuclear bombs Germany, Belgium, uh, Turkey, Italy, and what, what's the fifth? Netherlands. Netherlands, with our nuclear bombs on there, right on Russia's border. You know. So yeah. we. Anyway. Well, well we, we've gone on quite a while. Very, very good information. Any, do you, either of you have any closing comments? No, just uh, keep it up. Keep up the good work, everybody. Well, I would, I would close with this. Any of the, I think, 324 Congress members in the United States, and I believe 73 senators who just voted against moving 10%, a mere 10% out of this madness we've been discussing uh, into human and environmental needs should not be permitted to show their face in public, much less be cheered for and campaigned for uh, moving forward. That's, that's beyond the pale. Um, I, just, I wanna thank you for this. I think we never talk like this. And what Bruce said is true, even in the peace movement, Whenever you start showing up and saying something good about Russia, you know, or that we did the wrong thing, people like they, they diss you, they don't want to hear about it, they walk away from you. So I hope we can get this out and talk about the truth, you know, like telling the truth about our history. I hope so too. Thank you so much to Alice Slater and Bruce Gagnon. My name's David Swanson. Uh, good day. Bye bye. Bye.